All right, great. Are you all with me? So wonderful to have a, a full house here, and I'm going to make it worthwhile. Thank you for joining this webinar on successful project implementation, how to accelerate your results. I'm delighted you're here because today I'm going to show you how you can achieve greater success in work and life by transforming how you plan and implement projects. That's right, projects. I'll share what I believe are the most vital skills you need to thrive these days, whatever your profession or background. So let's start with a curious question. In what world do you work? See how many of these questions you can answer yes. Do you deal with change? Do you do non-routine work? Does your work involve more brains than brawn? Or perhaps you're a professional wrestler. <laughs> do you deal with projects? You have big goals. You face complex, fuzzy, or strategic issues. If you had at least one yes, you live in project world. And be glad that you do, because project world is where the action is. Think about it for a minute. Projects drive progress. Look at any big city skyline created by projects. Look at the electronic miracle you're watching this on created by projects. All strategy is implemented through projects. Strategies, strategic initiatives require projects. In fact, you might say projects are us <laughs> because you're involved in projects in so many different ways as a team member, a participant, a stakeholder, a champion. So whether you're a consultant, a manager, salesperson, planner, HR leader, engineer, technologist, entrepreneur, IT expert, or any other skilled professional, you deal with projects and you need to be good at it. But today's projects are not easy due to complexity, rapid change, but they're more vital than ever. I believe that project management is a life skill. I'm going to go beyond that to say that strategic project management, which I'll teach you today, is definitely a life skill. So let me ask you, have you ever faced these problems, especially if you work in a large organization? Greater pressure to deliver. Not everyone's on the same page. You can't get buy-in among, among the various stakeholders. Nasty surprises come up. A lot of talk, not much action and you implement the plan but still fail? Well, if so, you're not alone. And today I'm gonna to teach you what may, may be the most important skill every professional needs, whatever your field, how to smoothly turn good ideas into actionable projects which reach their goals. So let's start by examining two essential disciplines. The first is strategic planning. Oh, some of you I know are yawning because strategy is not always exciting. It can be abstract and many strategic plans just sit on the shelf gathering dust. The second is project management. Now, if I hear some groans out there, it's because you've had a boss in the past who wants to offload boring work and she says, I have a project for you. <laughs> Let's look at the track record of these two disciplines. 70% of all strategies fail, according to Fortune magazine. That's a pretty dismal statistic. I know my friends in the Association for Strategic Planning, we're changing that. But right now, it's a problem. Project management, equally bad. 70% of all strategies and projects fail, according to the Gartner Group. I believe that the seeds of failure begin with how we plan projects in the beginning. The conventional approaches, just aren't designed for today's fast moving efforts involving intangibles, information and change. I'm gonna show you something better. I think he was the original hippie, check out that haircut and quizzical look. Albert Einstein said it this way, we cannot solve our problems with the same type of thinking used when they were created. We need a new thinking and here's my take on the new thinking. Let's merge the two methodologies. We obviously need strategic planning. It's vital to navigate the future. We obviously need project management as a way to execute. They're both okay as standalones, but when we merge them, they're even better. It's like apple pie is great, vanilla ice cream is great, but you put them together and you have apple pie a la mode. Well, by linking these two, we end up with a discipline I call 
Strategic Project Management. So get ready for a fresh perspective on how you can execute projects beginning with a strategic approach. Now, if you've read my book, Strategic Project Management Made Simple by John Wiley, you probably learned that it integrates best practices, it's practical and flexible, and it features a logical framework approach. It's earned raving fans because of its simplicity, but don't just take my word for it. Check out the Amazon reviews. Today, I'm going to pull from that book and specifically teach you how to avoid the activity trap getting caught up in the details and getting lost before you understand the big objectives, how to get everyone on the same page, singing the same hymn, how to design projects faster, how to reduce the problems in advance, accelerate your implementation, and reach your goals quicker. Specific takeaways are three. Number one, I'm going to give you an essential two-word concept that's missing from the management vocabulary and is so critical. Second, I'm going to share the four critical strategic questions that lead to great results. And third, I'm going to introduce you to the logical framework approach. My life mission. I take my life mission seriously. It's to help leaders at all levels to think better, plan smarter, act faster, and get great results, which make a difference in the world that you operate in. I believe this is a time we all need to step up, expand our game, because there's big problems out there and big opportunities that need us. By listening to this presentation so far, you have identified yourself as someone committed to making a greater difference, and I'm going to help you do just that. A little bit about my career journey so you understand how these ideas developed. I started out as a rocket scientist, working for NASA, playing a small role in a big project to put men on the moon. And that's where I began my lifelong journey and study of project management. I then became a federal government planner, working in the US Department of Transportation in Washington, DC, responsible for supporting the national aviation system. And I learned the art and science of strategic planning. Then I switched careers quite dramatically and became an international development advisor. Working for USAID and the World Bank in over 25 countries. And there I learned the art of systems thinking. And that's important because if we take a piecemeal approach to any complex undertaking, it usually fails. For example, I remember in West Africa, we were designing a project to reduce child mortality. We had to not only educate the mother, but also be, be concerned about sanitation, nutrition, water, and to make sure that the solutions fit the culture. Think about your own projects. I'll bet you need to take a more holistic approach and think outside the bar chart to incorporate external factors in your solution. And today I'll show you how to do so. I then became a management consultant with corporate and government clients in all industries, high tech, low tech, no tech. And that's where I really learned how to help people get results. And when I moved into the private sector, clients told me things like, in corporate in corporations, we're frustrated. We try to do good work, but the tools are inadequate. The systems for planning are designed to serve the organization and not the individual. There's no common language. As a result, when we do cross-functional initiatives, we don't have a common solution approach. I also worked with consultants, entrepreneurs, who found it difficult to sell projects because they couldn't really show the benefits in the logical fashion, and they couldn't bring the clients on board in the solution strategy. So what I did is I adapted the logical framework to these contexts by simplifying it, and I'm happy to say it worked great. Some people have called this methodology the missing piece. Those people often have PMP certificates, well-trained in the detailed discipline of project management, who now want to move upstream and see how to connect it with the larger strategy. I believe this, that ordinary people using the right tools 
can achieve extraordinary results. And I've seen it happen so many times because everyone who works is committed to getting a result, but a lot of things get in the way and you need the right tools. Here's what some people say about this process. From Raytheon, all the tools you need to jumpstart your projects at the speed of light. Thank you, April. From Microsoft, Philippe Gottschall hits the nail on the head with fresh approaches to achieve goals. Vice President of Sony Pictures, we used your method to organize and execute an awards campaign that earned numerous nominations and awards, including an Oscar. A physicist, Lori at Los Alamos National Lab, you changed how I do my planning, and this has significantly increased my ability to reach my goals. And finally, Clovis Ash, a petty officer aboard the aircraft carrier USS Enterprise. I took your approach to the deck of the USS Enterprise. We now use your system to plan new weapon systems which defend our country. So as you can see, the background of these individuals is very varied. And I truly believe the best thing that any person can do is to develop a strategic mindset because that's a portable skill set that you can take anywhere. So I invite you all to Get ready for this. Unleash your inner strategic project manager. I'm challenging everyone here to step up, realizing that strategy is not just a job skill, it's a life skill. And here's what's great about this. The same techniques I'm giving you that will apply on the job, apply in your life as well. So use the right tools and get better results. My question for you. If you had strategic superpowers, how would you use them for good? How would you apply them? Would you, for, for example, accelerate your current results, take on a new project perhaps, refocus your team, get back to its core mission, seize an opportunity, distinguish your career brand, make things simpler, improve your business? Would you change the world in some way? Think about your own BHAG, big, Carry audacious goal. And as I get into the meaty meat content in this next section, see how it might apply. So get ready. Have pencil and paper to take notes because we're going to rock and roll. Introducing the logical framework approach. I think you're going to like this. I'll be able to give you an overview of it. And for more depth, there's some opportunities in terms of how to do that. By the way, I'm gonna give you as much as I possibly can today in the time available. And for those who wanna go deeper, there's an opportunity I'll describe towards the end in which you can work directly with me to really develop mastery. And whether you choose to do that or not, hang in here till the very end because I have a surprise gift for everyone that I'll reveal at that point. So the logical framework, what does it provide? It provides a common language. A common language based on the systems thinking approach which applies in so many different arenas. An integrated framework to think, plan, and act and get results. A way to build strong teams and accelerate your projects. So structurally, the logical framework looks something like this. A four by four matrix with four columns, the first one called objectives, the second success measures, next verification, and finally assumptions. And there's four rows, goal, purpose, outcomes, and inputs, basically four levels of objectives. But this is not simply a set of boxes to fill out. It's an interactive thinking system where information that you put in one element can trigger an idea in another element, kind of like a Sudoku puzzle, a project design tool that brings out your very best thinking, whether you're doing it on your own or with a group. You know. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to appreciate this truism. It comes from NASA Rule 15. A review of most failed projects and project problems indicates that the disasters were well planned to happen from the start. The seeds of problems are laid down early. Initial planning is the most vital part of a project. But you would be amazed at how many times I see major projects that begin with nothing more than attack 
task list. They often frequently run into problems early. I believe that bad initial planning leads to bad project design, and bad project design gives you a bad result. Here are some examples. Not sure they thought that one through adequately. Okay. This one here, this one may have been Photoshop, but it's embarrassing nonetheless. And I truly believe in male bonding, but <laughs> this is just a little bit ridiculous. There are some planning red flags that I've identified in 30 years of working with project teams of all types. There are seven big ones. I'm going to give you three of the primary ones and then show you how we can work around these. Number one, missing linkages. Is there a clear line of sight between your efforts and how that ripples up to impact an important goal? Are the objectives clear? If you don't know where you're going, you will end up where you don't want to be. And I hear objectives throwing around, thrown around like, we want to be a learning-based organization. We want to shift our culture. And everyone nods their head and says, yes, 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 yes. But no one really understands what they're talking about because they haven't developed measures, they haven't identified assumptions, and they haven't linked these objectives into a hierarchy. And the third is loose language. I believe that words mean things, but in the management and strategy area, there's no standard vocabulary and people use different words in different ways. The language simply is sloppy. So let's see how we can deal with some of these. First, a bit more about the logical framework and its origins. In the late 1960s, Congress asked USAID, our foreign aid program, what are the benefits of foreign aid? USAID couldn't answer the question because they didn't have a system that allowed for integrated planning, implementation, and evaluation. So as a result, the logical framework, oops, okay. As a result, the logical framework is developed in the solution. The logical framework evolved in response to that need. I was recruited by the team that created this approach and helped to extend it worldwide through the USAID missions. Later on my own, I improved it, I simplified it, and brought it in to the private sector. My golly, what's this? Well, maybe you've heard of the KISS principle. I interpret that as keep it simple, Schmidt. When I brought the logical framework approach to the private sector, it was a little bit too complex, so I simplified it by emphasizing two concepts, a two-word concept I'll share with you, and I developed four questions and steps, which is a great takeaway because, because you can apply it in so many situations. So I'm going to offer you what I think is the simplest, most powerful, two-word concept in strategic management. Get ready to write this down. Ladies and gentlemen, you have it? It is. If, then. If then thinking, also called means ends or cause effect, and it's really a key to aligning objectives and designing a strategy that will work. You probably heard this term before, thanks to Kevin Cosner in the movie Field of Dreams, and he was a Iowa corn farmer in the process of going bankrupt, and he came up with a wild-haired idea. Maybe you can recite the classic line from Field of Dreams with me, and do it together, please. Don't be shy. It is, if we build it, then they will come. An if-then predictive relationship. We call this a strategic hypothesis because it describes a relationship between two variables that involves uncertainty, or in simple words, it's an educated guess. So let's go a little bit deeper here. The logic was if we build it, being a baseball field, then they will come. They being the formerly great baseball players, now deceased, who are going to rise from the dead. Hey, it can happen in Hollywood. But is there a higher level objective above this? Well, he was going bankrupt, so perhaps the objective was to save the farm. Now, what we have here is a three-level relationship, and let me put some simple words on it. 
This is the what we can make happen, the project deliverables. If I contract this out, for example, this is what I'll get back. This is the why that motivates my effort. It's the change I expect after the deliverables are in place. And this is a big picture strategic objective that motivates this whole project. So the first planning question that you want to ask is this. What are we trying to accomplish and why? And if you take nothing more from this seminar than this idea, it'll be well worthwhile. The important part of that is the why. But we frequently ignore this question or rush through it in the rush to get to the how. We're going to come back later and add the how. The how is the action steps, the action plan, the bar chart, the task list to get to the deliverables. Cut the corn, plow the field, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a later step. Actually, it's step four in my system. And a big mistake, I see it all the time, especially with engineers and technical people, is they'll get a sense of the objectives and then jump to detailed action planning, question number four, before they really filled in questions number two and three. So let's continue. Question number one, what are we trying to accomplish and why? I want to drill down in this because it's an important one. We're trying to accomplish objectives, desired results. Question for you, how many objectives does a project have? Well, my answer is more than one. Projects have multiple objectives, and they exist at different levels in the cause-effect hierarchy. Some are very action-oriented. This is an objective we do today. Some are deliverable. Some are high-level goals. So we must organize these in relationship to each other using if-then logic, and we want to have a precise terminology to define what each level means as a way to stop the confusion. Now, in management, we don't all speak the, lang the same language. The language is loose. We throw around all kinds of terms, outcome, strategy, measure, result, intent, and objective, goal, output, hope. <laughs> and we may or may not have a fixed idea of what this means in our mind, but we certainly haven't calibrated it with what other people think. So there is the sense of communicating, but there really isn't much com communication occurring. So we need a common language. A common language will help to build trust, promote shared, under shared understanding, clarify any differences we have early in the game, create better solutions, and let the teams move faster. First of all, a metaphor. I'm a big dog lover, as Eric pointed out. These are all dogs. You got your chow chow, you have your poodle, you have your schnauzer, you have your bulldog, you have your German shepherd, you have the Great Dane. That's probably the most egotistical of the dogs, the Great Dane, right? The point is, they're all dogs, but each one is a specific type of dog with certain characteristics. In a similar manner, these are all objectives, a term, goal, purpose, outcomes, and inputs. And each one has a specific characteristic. It's a specific type. It has a specific meaning. And that gives power to communicating complex ideas and working as a team to move forward. Since there is no official set of definitions, I'm going to give you these according to Schmidt. Change them if you want, but make sure the term you use is attached to an underlying concept. Goal purpose, outcomes, and inputs. Goal is the why, the big picture context or benefit that motivates this project and perhaps other projects as well. The purpose, the change expected. What do we expect to have happening after our project is complete? The outcomes, the set of deliverables, the inputs, the tasks and resources. Now we're pretty familiar with bar charts, those kind of methodologies. That's all input level stuff. The logic, if inputs, then outcomes, if outcomes and purpose, if purpose, then goal. It cascades up. 
So let's uh, come back to this chart here and simply put these words in, goal, purpose, outcomes, and inputs. Now with the team, that really helps to clarify and to build a strong structural foundation for a successful project. The importance of each level, goal, the larger aiming point, purpose, the change expected after the outcome. If you build it, you want them to come. If you create a new management system, you want people to use it. If you train people, you want behaviors to change. So you want to focus on the purpose, outcomes, the deliverables, inputs, activities, and resources. But purpose is where you should put your planning focus. Why is this important? Well, because project completion is not project success. I know there are some people in this chat who are with the Project Management Institute, uh, certified by them perhaps, as I am. And my beef with most project management methodologies, textbooks, training courses, they define project success as providing deliverables on time and budget. And it says nothing about solving the underlying business problem or creating the change the project was motivated by. So we want to focus on purpose. That's the linchpin that connects what you can make happen, which are the outcomes, with the larger goal. It clarifies the change you expect, links deliverables to that goal. So put your design focus here. It's so easy to get in the weeds. Design, if you design your projects to reach purpose and not just produce outcomes, you're going to have much more successful results. So the power of if-then thinking, to sum this up, it makes strategy simpler to describe, communicate, and improve, if you can do it in terms of if-then linkages. It illuminates the mental models in our minds. Engineers think differently than our HR professionals. They think differently than IT folks. Links the efforts to the big picture. Unless you test an approach early to do a proof of concept before you've invested resources that may be wasted. Bottom line, achieve better results sooner. Now I'm going to go through an example. And what example to use? Well, business examples were tough because not all of you can relate to the same context. So I chose a colorful, somewhat silly, non-business example inspired by my next door neighbor, George. Even though this is a simple uh, story, it will illustrate how the log frame can help you develop a more complete solution. So I want you to meet George and help George. Here's George. <laughs> he used to have six pack abs and now it's kind of more of a keg. George's problem is that he's regularly attacked by double stuffed Oreos. George told me he wanted to get in shape, so let's put the logical framework approach to work in designing a strategy. First thing we do, construct an if-then hierarchy. George says, I want to get my body in shape. Well, why do you want to do that? So I can become fit and healthy and sexy. Okay, sounds good. Why do you want to do that? Well, really, my goal is to live a long and happy life. Sounds great, George. This is the what he can make happen. This is the why. This is a higher level why. And later on, we're going to develop the complete action plan, the how, exercise daily, and things like that. How's it sounding so far? Excellent, excellent. So let's put this into a logical framework grid. The goal, long and happy life. Purpose, fit and healthy. Outcome, outcome number one, get body in shape. But as we looked at it, we say, if outcomes, then purpose, is that sufficient? And we realize that, yeah, maybe I have to do something about those eating habits as well. So those become two discrete outcomes because they're separable. And in a corporate sense, you want to structure your outcomes as things that can be delegated to discrete individuals. And then some of the activities to get there, we actually will want to go through the other parts of it before we flesh out the activities. But here's a start. And then 
If these inputs, then these outcomes. If this outcome, then this purpose. If this purpose, then this goal. Great. So critical question number two what is, how will we measure success? We want to measure success at each of those levels with clear success measures of quality, quantity, time, other performance measures, cost, customer, whatever pins it down and describes it. Success measures do several things. They help us to clarify what the objectives mean, define the conditions that indicate they've been achieved. And this is so important. If all the key stakeholders agree on what success looks like from the beginning and sets up clear indicators and a way to verify that, it certainly reduces the squabbling and the finger pointing that might occur later. Identify how to verify the measures through the verification column. At the same time you set up the measures, you say, how are we gonna track this? But measures are tricky, as my management philosopher friend Gilbert says. Our goal this year is zero disabling injuries. Is that a good goal? Well, last year our goal was 26 disabling injuries. In retrospect, that was a mistake. Why was it a mistake? Well, we had to injure nine employees to meet the goal. Now, all you HR people out there, this is a joke. <laughs> okay. So let's return to George and develop some measures. It's useful to develop measures top down. So what do we mean by a long and happy life? Well, live to 100 or at least to 85. Verify that by counting the candles on the cake every year. Become fit and healthy. Well, there might be multiple measures here. Blood pressure is such and such. Verified by a doctor check. Resting heart rate is reduced to Y. Pulse counts. And we continue down. And the power of this is we can identify the magnitude of each outcome necessary to get to the next level. So getting body in shape. One indicator, the body mass index, not more than X percent. Get off those calibers to verify it. Eating habits improved, 1,800 calories, rich in fiber, low fat. Got to watch those Oreo cookies. And you're going to count those. Okay, so we're putting our measures into place. That's great. Critical question number three is, what other conditions must exist? What has to happen outside the boundary of the scope of work? What must be true? in order for our project to succeed. And this is the key to squeezing out the problems at the very beginning. This is risk management and risk reduction. We want to identify core assumptions. A factor needed for success, which is probably beyond our direct control, they're always present whether we define them or not. And if we don't define and analyze them at the beginning, they can crop up in nasty ways. Identify uh, risk through assumptions. It's an easy way to get everyone aboard. See if you agree with me on this. I believe that virtually every failure of strategy or a project can be traced back to a faulty assumption. Hmm. Think that's true in your context? Here are some examples you may have heard about. About 12 years ago, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory sent a $125 million Mar uh, orbiter to Mars. It crash landed because one set of engineers was working with metric measurements and another with English measurements, and they didn't uh, check, to which I say, whoops. Maybe you heard about this one. An extended family traveling from the Philippines to Canada included parents, kids, grandparents, over a dozen people all together. They passed through customs in Vancouver, were late to their connecting flights, they got on the connecting flight, had different seat assignments, and they discovered halfway through that they left their 18-month-old kid behind. Mama said to Grandma, I thought you had him. No, I thought you had him. To which I can only say, whoops, another bad assumption. So realize that every plan that you developed rests on the validity of certain assumptions. They can include technology factors, competitor factors, resource factors, coordination, other people, 
dependencies, interfaces, all that stuff that can crop up to bite you. Here's three steps to managing assumptions. Identify what they are. What else needs to be true for this logic to be valid? Second, analyze them. There are dozens of important assumptions. Look at each one for the impact, if it's not valid, and the probability that it's not valid. And if you have concern, there are five ways you can act on them to reduce risk. Some of the assumptions are so essential that you may end up turning them into objectives, adding other tasks, make it another project. So critical question number four then is how do we get there? And that one is reasonably straightforward. It's traditional conventional project management in which we identify inputs, tasks, schedules, resources. And if you're a Microsoft project fan or Primavera or have an enterprise system and just can't wait to get to software, now's your chance. You can put a simple bar chart inside the logical framework or for large projects at this point, turn to software because the logical framework has done its job and done it well. How do you test your project design? How do you see if it might hang together? Well, you can do this with a logic test with what I call the implementation equation. And it's a way uh, to see if you have all the important elements. We really want to design these top down, beginning with goal and working down, but you test them bottom up by asking if these inputs, if we do these tasks and these assumptions are valid, can we produce these outcomes? What might get in the way? What else do we need? If these outcomes plus these assumptions, will we get to this purpose? And do we have the necessary set of outcomes? Do we have a sufficient set? If purpose and assumption, then goal. And I've seen so many groups go through this logical process and fill in the gaps and remove the problems in advance so Murphy and his infamous law do not strike. So let's return to George, see if we can add some assumptions, help him out. He's been impressed with our work so far. We have an assumption there that he can give up Oreo cookies. It's a big one, George, the behavioral assumption. What can we do to make that happen? The second assumption is that his spouse is supportive. Now his spouse happens to come from a great Italian family. She makes fabulous spaghetti and there's spaghetti and meatballs on his plate every night. And that's just the appetizer. So he's going to get some cooperation. He's going to need cooperation from his spouse. And in a serious corporate sense, you always need the collaboration of other players. So if these assumptions are not true, you have some work to do. At the next level, he continues to exercise. At the higher level, no accidents. He doesn't get hit by a beer truck or an Oreo cookie truck, and there's no genetic disease. So let's test this here. If we do these inputs and those assumptions are valid, we can produce those outcomes. If those outcomes and these assumptions, I continue exercise, are there some other things? Go ahead and add them now. Now is the chance. If they're part of your systems approach to projects, then you can become healthy. If I become fit and healthy and no accidents and genetic disease, I can live a long and happy life. Hmm. Okay. I have a long life in here. I may need some other parallel projects to produce the happiness part. And those parallel projects would have different purposes, uh, perhaps around relationships or finance but they would contribute to that same goal. So that's how you can link projects together in a more sophisticated uh, strategic program management context. I'm sure you have some questions. We'll get to those in a little bit, but let me wrap up uh, this part with this perspective here. The logical framework integrates multiple valuable perspectives. Here we see project management, which focuses on turning inputs into outcome deliverables. Here we see strategic planning, which focuses on where do we want to go in the future? What kind of changes are necessary to get there? Through the assumptions and the vertical logic, we have a somewhat scientific approach. 
to test the logic of our design using a strategic hypothesis. Now, the big management junkies out there, you can probably see where MBO, management by objectives, lean, six sigma, ROI calculations fit in, because the logical framework is sort of a meta system to organize all the other elements of your thinking process. And it's especially appropriate for complex projects. I would say if your project is excessively simple, like painting a house, you probably don't need this. If it's a huge one, like world peace, uh, you probably need some other tools as well. But for medium, uh, small, and uh, large size projects, it's a great, great tool. Recap again these four questions, how they drive the logical framework. Question number one, what are we trying to accomplish and why? Let's us set up the hierarchy of linked objectives of the form if then. Question number two, how will we measure success? Pins down what each of these objectives looks like using success measures and a means of verification. So that verification column is the means of monitoring progress towards outcome and evaluating impact. Third question, what other conditions must exist? What assumptions are we making? How valid are they? If it's an uncertain assumption, what can we do to reduce the risk? And then finally, how do we get there? So in summing up, what this approach helps you to do is design sound action plans. And I have literally seen a group take a day to design projects that they took three months to design earlier because they had a framework to organize their ideas, to communicate, to get everyone on board, to work out the problem areas. Link projects to goal, so important. Why are you building it? You want them to come. Communicate and collaborate across functional disciplines, across cultural differences. Some of my clients are using this. They have worldwide virtual teams. It's just a great way to get everyone on the same page. Eliminate some of the problems early. Get teams moving faster. If you do that, you'll achieve results sooner. Now, I would, I would hope that this has stimulated some ideas on your part. So let me ask you, what are some ways that you might put this uh, approach to work? If you go ahead in the question box, uh, just type in some of the ideas that you have, some of the projects you might apply this to. I'd be interested in knowing how you see the value of this methodology. So take a, take a little bit of time and do this in the question box, please. And while you're doing that, uh, Terry, just want to let you know, um, Jabal Shah from India is asking if, uh, won't the eating habits fit under inputs? Uh, certainly the behaviors, yes, absolutely. The behaviors he has to do on the eating habits are input actions. He has to, uh, you know, cook, uh, cook, uh, yeah, Indian vegetables with curry. <laughs> I was looking for a gulab jamon. Uh, but yes, absolutely. A lot, of, a lot of looking at the assumptions will trigger input action ideas. Great catch. Jabal. Great. We're getting, we're, getting some, we're getting some input now on uh, projects that uh, people might use this for. Uh, one of them is to research and then implement a talent management system. Excellent. Uh, current job search for Elizabeth. Oh, very nice. Uh, this will this will simplify project management management approach and make it easier for the team to get other teams to plan. Good. That's from Jury Wales, and then documenting this and reviewing with team prior to detailed planning will allow everybody to identify the same goals. In other words, get alignment. Says Stacy. Yes, great. Nice, nice work. Uh, Janet says that she can apply it to training rollouts. Yep. Um, Sherry Brown is asking, what are the other five planning flags? The other five planning flags, uh, I actually uh, don't have time for them today. I cover them in a, a follow-on course I'll introduce in just a little bit. Another project to apply to is whole school improvement. Excellent. I have, Another a, one is yeah, I have a consultant in the Washington, D.C. area. She is trying to reform the educational system and found the logical framework a great way to get the teachers and administrators on the same page. Uh, Dennis Ryan plans to use it for wedding planning. Good. <clears throat> uh, 
and Magdi is inquiring as to how can we put assumptions in place for goal, purpose, and income. Okay. Um, quick. Uh, the the quick answer to that is to ask what must be true to go from one level to another, to go from outcomes to purpose. You know. Uh, in the field of dreams example, outcome, if they build it, then they will come. We have to assume that these baseball players want to come. <laughs> we have to assume that fans will come and pay. We have to assume that the fans know about the baseball park, and those all then become additional outcomes for the project. Okay, those are great. Uh, any specific, uh, well, let me just add a few of my thoughts here. Some typical high up high payoff applications is a great way to update the strategic plan. Uh, I was brought into the National Training Center, U.S. Department of Energy, um, in terms of how they can more effectively safeguard nuclear weapons at nuclear power plants and in the uh, research laboratories. They found the logical framework, just an ideal way to chunk out various initiatives and put teams behind them. Strengthen teams of all types. What often happens in a team is everyone is looking at the project from their own specific discipline or organizational interest, but by focusing on purpose and goal, you get a unified sense of how to make this happen. Reinventing your department, come up with a fresh purpose statement. How do you measure success and what's the outcome set to get there? Developing project plans for key goals. I think that speaks for itself. Increasing sales, making decisions where the purpose is to make a, a smart decision on procurement or a system. The outcome set are things like outcome number one, alternatives clarified, outcome number two, criteria identified, out, outcome number three, analysis, outcome number four, recommendation, et cetera, et cetera. A very clear way to structure things that, that are usually not captured well in, uh, in most methodologies. Improve a critical process, it's great for process improvement at all levels. Develop talent, somebody said that earlier, thank you. Manage change projects of all type. And I saw somebody getting married, that was great. Uh, lots of personal life applications as well. Start a business, Boy Scout or Girl Scout fundraising, plan for retirement, coach a sports team, community and church projects, changing careers, grand adventures. If you wanna to go to the moon, <laughs> Start with a logical framework. Getting married. I saw someone had that in there. Great. Uh, someone also has given me a logical framework to get unmarried. <laughs> so as you can see, the applications are simple because the concepts are generic. The concepts uh, apply in virtually every context. Here are some organizations that have invited me in to teach this to their staffs. The point I want to make is that this approach is used by real people for real projects, and they're getting real results, and it's gonna work for you too. Okay, uh, any, any Q&A, any additional questions that you have? Just put them in the box. There are a couple of questions still, still pending here, <clears throat> Terry. Um, one of them uh, mentions that Deming says 96% of problems with failed outcomes are designed into the system. He held that we should drive out blame. However, if the culture is toxic, how can the log frame help? Well, with a toxic culture, uh, let's say that you have one or two individuals who uh, might be champions of change. Start with, an start with a logical framework that says at the purpose level, to have a learning-based, change-focused culture where everyone gets along and uh, enjoys their work. And then come up with the measures of that. See if people want to, want to get along and enjoy their work. Uh, if you do that, you can begin identifying some of the key outcomes. I would say in, in this case, there are some assumptions that are not valid. For example, you have to assume that the top management team sets a good example. You have to assume that people are treated fairly or they sense they're treated fairly. So um, I think this is an interesting way to, to look at a dysfunctional culture of some sort and to isolate what some of the key variables may be. 
Okay, and Keith is asking, what's the best way of getting agreement with the client relative to goals and successful outcomes? Okay, uh, I would probably say at the goal level, uh, when this is project, when this project is successful, what will you see, and describe it in measurable form, quality, quantity, time, uh, impact on different stakeholders. Because what happens as you define measures, it will sharpen the statement of objective itself. And then you can percolate down to say, okay, well, what's one of the outcomes that we need to do to, to get there? And if we do that, what's the purpose? What's the linking objective that cascades up the chain? Let's okay. Do more Yep. Tina, Tina is asking, if you don't get agreement in the planning stage, do you abandon the project? Uh, well, I think what I would do is look at the root cause of why you don't get agreement. Certainly, I would not proceed if you don't have agreement among key stakeholders. That's probably one of the red flags as well. And if you, uh, if you can't get agreement, you know, have to figure out why. Is it, is it the wrong strategy, the wrong goal? Do you have a dysfunctional culture? Certainly, don't move ahead on it. What I would probably do in that case is to take a logical framework with a purpose statement saying that there is, uh, there is agreement and con commitment on how to proceed. Outcome number one would perhaps be people's objection to the plan are documented. Number two, that they're evaluated against a certain set of criteria, et cetera, et cetera. And I would also look at some of the assumptions because the assumptions are where the killer factors for any good strategy often lie. Uh, it might be that you know people are overwhelmed, or people, you know, are not being treated fairly, or that if they take on this additional project, how in the heck are they going to handle everything else? How does this compare to other strategic planning systems? Is a question from John Howard. Well, I would say that it, it's compatible with other strategic planning systems. It's it's probably uh, let me put it this way. I I had a director of Symantec uh, say. This is, gives us 80% of the functionality of the more complex systems at only 20% of the effort. So uh, if you have a strategic planning effort and there are some strategies or initiatives developed, that's the point at which you can put them into the logical framework. The big breakdown I see is going from strategic plans to projects. And the if-then logic provides a clear line of sight that can be communicated so that the people doing the work have an understanding of why. It's often in corporations, uh, the people responsible for the execution have not been privy to the conversations leading to the development of the strategy. Great question. Let's do one more. Uh, Jamal is asking, what if you cannot identify all the possible assumptions in the beginning? Well, you never can, you never can. Uh, but get started and see if there if there are some killer factors out there that oh my golly this isn't you know this isn't going to work. Um, you have to deal with those. Other assumptions will come up as you proceed. Now what I didn't get into today is the idea of of a process how you how you revisit the logical framework as implementation proceeds. So let's say it's a three month project. I would say every month revisiting the log frame and say is this still the best set of outcomes. Are these assumptions valid? What have we learned that might change our project design? Projects and project plans are not static documents. It's a way to capture our best thinking at any point in time and move forward, keeping in mind the purpose and the goal and not getting caught up in the weeds of the input activity. Hey, let's do one more. This is great. Okay, Sam in Paris is asking, does participative planning help reduce project failure simply because people support what they help create? I think that's a great, great question, and you've uh, you've answered it by the nature of the, the answer. Yes, absolutely. People support what they help create. If you have, uh, well, I learned this early in my career as a consultant. I was asked to go to Guatemala and develop a tourism infrastructure plan for um, Central American nations, and they gave me all the documents. I went to the Hilton Hotel and put together per charts and all these diagrams and came back and delivered the plan. Well, six and six months later, I came back and nothing had happened on the plan. And I asked why. And they said, well, you know, people didn't understand what you were doing. So 
by virtue of having a participative approach, you get better ideas, you get better commitment, you end up with better solutions. Okay, great questions, thank you. So let me move on here. I think you've answered some, of the, answered some of these questions. If you had project superpowers, how would you use them for good? Some of the things that came up, refocusing teams, seizing an opportunity, distinguishing your career, simplifying things, changing the world. And now I want to introduce the program. Uh, if you've gotten value to this point, great. And I know some of you are going to want to go deeper in this. So I want to introduce what I call Project Accelerate Now. You know, just about everyone who signed on is still here. What this says is that you're a leader committed to elevate your game, make bigger contributions, and get properly rewarded. And if that's true, I'm opening up a program where I will personally coach you in learning and applying this approach. Plus, you'll get over $2,000 worth of valuable bonuses for absolutely no charge. And I'm so confident you'll benefit from my system. I'm offering all my tools, tips, and techniques at no risk to you, 100% money back guarantee. So Project Accelerate Now is a dynamic webinar based program featuring best practice and tools focused on the logical framework approach to give you a portable lifelong skill set. You will learn how to turn problems into a solution, get everyone focused on the same goal, design projects of all types, reduce some of the obstacles in advance, build committed and capable teams, starting faster and succeeding sooner. What you will get, five 90, web, 90 minute webinars each Tuesday, beginning on September 10. Downloadable tips and notes. And each following Friday, there's a live Q and A session, but they're archived for your convenience. So if you can't make the live sessions, look at them at your convenience. Some of you are eager beavers, so I'll give you some quick start videos and electronic templates to get going. There'll be extra bonuses along the way. I'm creating them right now. I think you'll find them exciting and interesting. The first two weeks, we're gonna master the fundamentals, explore all the logical framework principles, do a deep dive on the four steps and four critical questions. Be lots of examples along the way. You learn to apply causal, if then logic, define and align your objectives. Think both top down and bottom up. Turn if then ideas into a clear strategic hypothesis. How to test your project design. How to design for smooth implementation, involve stakeholders and avoid the most common mistakes that always crop up. We'll continue with how to choose meaningful measures. Verify measures, measure with the hard to measure using unobtrusive measures. Beat Murphy and his infamous law. Uncover some of the hidden implicit assumptions. Five ways to reduce risks. How to reali reality test your assumptions. You'll learn how to apply and use the implementation equation. How to link this to software. How to keep on track with action review so you can update the plans. Then in about the third week, we're gonna look at specifically work projects, and you can start anywhere with a problem, an issue, a work scope, a project idea. I'll go over seven generic design logics and R&D projects, marketing, process improvement, team building, information technology, system development, talent development. And if you have an idea, if you have a special concern, I will develop a logic plan for that as well. Module four. Bring it into your context, how you link it to other systems and processes, your strategic planning system, your balanced scorecard, how to incorporate things like agile, lean, work breakdown structures, how to prioritize your opportunities and five easy ways to get started now. Way back when <laughs> I wrote books and I looked like this. Yeah, I know I had more hair then. Thanks for pointing it out. But that developed my passion for strategic approaches to career and life management. So you're gonna love module five, which is how to reinvent your future, design a life, how to develop goals, strategies, and action plans for the non-work parts of your life, for personal objectives, family objectives, leisure, financial, relationship, community service, 
professional objectives, and more. What's great about this is that the very same concepts I'll teach you to apply to work projects apply equally well in the rest of your life. So I'm sure you're asking, what's the price? Well, companies pay me up to $10,000 a day to go into their organizations. Well, obviously, it's not going to be anything near that. It's not going to be $5,000 or $3,000. The price of this program is normally $997. But on my webinar, I'm offering you a special invitation of $497. This is the lowest this price will ever be. The next time I do the program, it'll be more. And you can make two easy payments if you wish. I just want you to be committed to your success. In addition, there are three valuable bonuses worth more than the price of the program itself. Bonus number one, a solutions library. Twelve of my very best logical framework examples that you can learn from. They cover a variety of topics. They offer templates that you can basically duplicate. The value of this, I sell this for $200 separately. Second, join me at UCLA. I'm the senior instructor at UCLA's famed extension uh, program, the technical management program, where I've taught twice a year for almost three decades now. And each March and September for one week, over 100, uh, between 100 and 200 professionals from all industries gather on campus. You can choose four courses from 20 different possibilities. I'm going to cover the first $600 of your tuition and make sure you have a great time. Bonus number three, and this one is huge, fully justifying your investment. You'll get one-on-one -on -one coaching from me on a topic of your choice because I want you to succeed. After you've learned the basics, I'll ask you to draft your first cut logical framework and we'll go over this in detail and I'll provide improvements. You'll end up with a high quality design ready to implement. If you don't currently have a project, that's okay because this is valid for one full year. My partner said, Terry, you're crazy to offer this because other clients will pay you up to $1,200 gladly for the same service. Well, maybe so, but I'm going to do it anyway to help you be successful. This bonus is for the first 12 people who sign up in this enrollment cycle. Why just the first 12? Well, because my time's limited. And second, I want to reward people who take fast action. They're usually the most committed and successful participants. So let's sum this up. What you get, the program valued at $997. First bonus, $200. Second bonus, $600. Personal coaching, $1,200. That comes to $2,997. Your investment is only $497 and two easy payments of $267. One more bonus. I just can't stop here. <laughs> I'm going to sweeten the pot with a program that I've developed with a nationally known psychologist called Emotional Strategy, Emotional Mastery for Strategic Leaders. This is how to manage your emotions and motivate yourself when you're stuck or feel down during the inevitable bumpy parts of your project and life cycle. By the way, at the start of the program, I offered a special gift. If you stick with me till the end, even if you don't enroll, the gift is going to be this module. So if you want that, I'll give you an address to email and put free gift in the heading uh, just so I know. And by the way, if you were invited by the Association for Strategic Planning, uh, there is an additional discount. You have the discount code in your letter. And if you can't find that, let me know. And if you came through ASP, yeah, you save even more. There is a 100% satisfaction guarantee. If this is not for you for any reason, you can simply return it for a full refund within 30 days. But I know what's going to happen. You'll get into this and you'll love it. You'll say this is one of the best investments you ever made in your professional development. So by now, you understand the benefits of this approach. So I encourage you to join me. The first program is going to be Tuesday, September 10th, the first Q&A session, the following Friday, and then weekly after that. So here's the information. Write this down. Uh, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash enroll me in all capitals. We'll get you the registration form. And if you have any questions, write to Project Accelerate Now. And I see we're missing an E in Accelerate, so go ahead and just 
stick that one in project accelerate now at gmail.com if you have problems registering or have any questions so let's wrap this up i invite you to join my program and i'll say this very directly as you begin to master this methodologies your capabilities will become bigger your opportunities will expand because you bring more to the table so my question is what are you doing to step up your game to achieve greater success this year? The best investment you can make is in yourself, learning skills that will serve you lifelong. So if you're serious, I'm going to take the risk with you and make it easier through the money back guarantee. So here's the enrollment link. If you have any hesitations, I suggest you try it. If you don't last, like it, ask for a refund, but you're going to love it. I'll close this admission cycle soon, so if this opportunity speaks to you, act now. Remember that nothing changes in your life until you make a change. So join me in this learning adventure. I'll make it fun, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, and have a great day.